Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Hubert Vaznak, as you can see on my uh, screen. Uh, and welcome to our first session for the uh, Chicago Booth uh, Angel Network of Texas. Uh, before we get started, just a, a quick administrative uh, uh, pieces here. The first thing is that you know everybody is muted, uh, but we do have a Q and A panel. Um, you know, you can click the button at the bottom of your screen and ask questions. Uh, and then you know, as we finish the session. Uh, if, if your questions are not answered uh, during the presentation, uh, we'll throw the lines open for people to ask questions live, okay? So before I, 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 I introduce today's speaker, uh, Mr. Ashok Rao, I'd like to introduce our organization, the CBAN, who stands for Chicago Booth Angel Network, and our chapter here is the Texan chapter, newly formed, and here are some uh, pictures of, the, of our founding members. Uh, unlike most of our other chapters from around the, the country and around the world, we are not specific to a city. We are actually um, uh, across Texas. As you see, my co-founders are from, uh, you know, Randy's from Austin, Rhett's from Dallas, and then Sanjay and Erica are fellow Houstonians. As an organization, uh, we, uh, right now, our membership is free. So, uh, you know, the, there is no fee charge to join this. Um, in terms of our priorities or focus, really we have two. The first is to identify and present early stage investment opportunities uh, to investors, not just in Texas, but around the country. And the second is, is to present educational events and sessions like today's session is gonna be. A little bit about what we focus on from an investment perspective. Uh, we look primarily at U.S. opportunities. It doesn't mean we won't um, uh, entertain opportunities from overseas, especially those brought to us by our sister chapters from other parts of the world. Industry-wise, we are industry agnostic at this point. Uh, and then, you know, naturally, by virtue of SEC requirements, uh, these investment opportunities are only open to high net worth in, uh, investors. Investors meaning not just individuals, but the recently expanded definition by the SEC to include uh, uh, business entities as well. So we create a kind of a, a, a group, a slate or a syndicate to invest. Uh, if, you are, if you're an, a, a Chicago booth alum, you're kind of automatically in, but if you're not, um, you know, we expect it's just a formality. You just contact us and say, hey, I'd like to be a part of this and you're in, right? Unless there's something glaring in your background, we're not going to be blocking any of those investments. We set the minimum investment at five thousand dollars at this point. So, you know, in our experience, the typical angel investor in such opportunities comes in at somewhere between uh, five and twenty-five. Some may go as high as fifty thousand, but uh, we set the threshold at five thousand uh, at this initial stage. So it becomes pretty digestible. It's an amount we feel you're not going to lose sleep over. Uh, and I'd encourage you to look at, you know, attending our, our, our next pitch event uh, scheduled for exactly at this time, a week from now. Uh, and uh, we have four very interesting companies that are going to be presenting. I'd be surprised if at least two, if not three of them, uh, are able to raise a fair amount of funding in our session. So, go on to the second part, which is uh, talking about today is uh, presentation uh, by uh, an old friend of mine, Ashok Rao. Um, he and I uh, share uh, our college alumni, uh, alumnus, alumni association. Uh, Ashok is a leading angel investor in Houston. For those of you who um, are not familiar with Goose Capital, it is arguably the most prestigious uh, angel investment group in Texas. As you'll see, Ashok is currently uh, that doesn't include the past positions he has had as chairman of various companies, but he is currently chairman of several companies, not just in the US, but India and even uh, Germany, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he's the former chair of Thai Global. For those of you who don't know what Thai is, Thai is the world's largest entrepreneurial organization with chapters in over 60 countries and a venerable who's who of entrepreneurs as charter members of their individual chapters. Uh, Ashok founded Trex Communications, a satellite company that was then sold to L3 Communications during the telecom heydays. Uh, he founded Midcom Communications, which he IPO'd. I believe he is the first 
person of Indian origin in the U.S. to have IPO'd uh, a company. Uh, apart from having held senior executive positions in many large companies, he was also president of Enron North America. Uh, he has produced five movies, I believe, of which four have won awards. And he is also a restaurant owner. For those of you who live in Houston, visit Houston, I'd suggest, I encourage you to visit Songkran. Uh, I believe the chef is a Michelin starred chef, so uh, uh, you will not be disappointed. And, uh, you know, for, for, for additional details, I'd say, hey, visit our website, you'll see his uh, detailed bio. He's accumulated enough of accolades that would normally take most people three or four lifetimes to so with that, I am going to hand the controls over to Ashok to tell us about angel investing. And I'm also shutting off my video because my devastating good looks will distract you people. Well, thank you, Hubert. Thank you. In fact, I'm still trying to recover from that very uh, glowing intro, which uh, I don't think people should believe. Uh, <laughs> it can't all be correct. Anyway. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining uh, the CBAN event here today where we're going to be talking about angel investing. Hubert asked me to name it Angel Investing 101. This uh, COVID-style uh, uh, speech-making is uh, sort of surreal, as I was discussing with Hubert just before you all came on. Um, I also do stand-up comedy, and uh, what is, what is uh, weird about COVID-style presentations is that everyone's on mute. So if you crack a joke, you don't hear the laughter back. Like right now, I rest my case. Uh, or maybe the joke wasn't so good. But let's get to angel investing. Let's take a look at what the blueprint is, what we're going to discuss today. So I'll just talk a little bit about what is investing in general, what is inve angel investing, who can be an angel investor, and why do you want to invest, and when should you not invest? What is investing? Well, it's sort of like gambling. You're putting money on the roulette wheel and hoping that you come up with the number you've picked. It's risking money and hoping for a big win. It's like investing in the stock market. However, there are various ways of invest investing as an individual. You could take your own money and invest it in your own venture. That's typically what an entrepreneur does. You could take your own money and invest it in someone else's company. That is what an angel does. And then you could take other people's money and invest it in other people's companies. And that's typically what venture capitalists, private equity firms and other uh, associations do. And the people make a cut out of just moving the money around and hopefully some of those companies make it big. And if we want to look at some other variants, there are like banks and government assistance and those kinds of places where also investments do occur. Types of investors, we just talked about it. That first category is the entrepreneur himself who takes his own money and invests it in his company and the three Fs that go with them, friends, family, and fools is what we say in the industry. The second category, we're gonna talk more about angels. And then of course, there's the venture capitalists and private equity firms that use other people's money. And the variance of that third category could be family foundations, banks, government grants, loans, strategic investors, financial institutions, and of course, the public through an IPO. This is the typical investment cycle for most companies. You start off, the founder has an idea, you gather some investment capital, either from your own savings account or from the three Fs. You start to spend that money, you get to the point where you can have a proof of concept and you raise angel financing to get you through the dip, what we call the valley of death. And it's only after you have validated your uh, business model, have proven some degree of traction, do venture capitalists and other kinds of other people's money come in. So as you can see, the angel investor is key to taking a startup out of that initial founding stage to the stage where serious outside money can come in, professional money can come in. And that valley of death, unfortunately, has a death rate of 90%. Nine out of 10 companies that are started fail. One out of 10 succeed. And those that do, then three out of 10 of those go on to become big successes. So it's about a 3% hit rate for big successes. 
The investor types, again, we talked about the entrepreneur, the angels, and the reason to talk a little bit more about the angels is not only do they put money in to other people's ventures, their own money, but they also deliver soft capital along with that hard capital, which is guidance, advice, access to their own personal networks and their friends' personal networks. And since angels tend to be somewhat older like me, uh, the networks can be quite extensive. And then the venture capitalists who are professional investment managers, and they mostly invest in companies that are coming out of that valley of death where people have, where the companies have sort of validated their business model. And that's why I have that little icon showing a vulture. So oftentimes venture capitalists are referred to as vulture capitalists. And I have a few good vulture capitalist jokes, but that's for some other time. But it all starts with the entrepreneur. All companies start with one or two or three or four, maximum five, I think, people. And this term entrepreneur really didn't exist when I started my first company. It's been incorporated into our lexicon only over the last 30 years. And it's been stolen from the French, like English has stolen from several languages, from the French word entreprendre, which literally means who undertakes. And given that nine out of 10 companies fail, then I guess most entrepreneurs could be also called undertakers. And it basically refers to people who start a company risking a lot, risking time and money. But the key is to be a successful entrepreneur must be endowed with the ability to innovate. Because not everybody can be or is an entrepreneur. And I say that because I believe to be an entrepreneur, you have to have the risk gene. And it really isn't a gene. It's the virus that infects people randomly. I think if you look at one's own family, I look at mine, it's not inherited. My dad was a general in the army. My two brothers are totally risk averse. They drive 55 miles an hour on the highway. I have two radar detectors in my car. So it's basically people either are risk inclined, the no fear, fear of failure, or they're not. And my anecdotal research says it's about 5% of the population and it's agnostic. As many women are entrepreneurially inclined as men, as many ethnically brown, black, white, whatever people are, ethnic, uh, are inclined to be entrepreneurial. Why is it that some places are a little more entrepreneurial than others? And that's because of environment and government rules and regulations. Great example is Singapore. Singapore is probably actually by World Bank standards, the most entrepreneur friendly country on earth. It's got the best uh, institutions to encourage risk-taking, but it is one of the least entrepreneurial countries on earth because of the culture where failure is excoriated. Unlike in the US where fail, fail fast is kind of celebrated. Good case in point about governments throttling innovation and entrepreneurship is both India and China. In 79, Deng Xiaoping opened up China and look at what China is today. In India, India almost failed in the early 90s and the prime minister who had a great solid last name. Can you all guess what the solid last name was? It was Rao. Prime Minister Rao opened up the economy and India went from being a socialistic failed state to being an economic juggernaut. So once again, people are entrepreneurially inclined it's very difficult to manufacture an entrepreneur. And one of the reasons I'm spending some time on entrepreneurs is angels invest in entrepreneurs. They change the world. And the great example is 200 years ago in the industrial revolution, we talk about the industrial revolution changing the world, but it was actually the entrepreneurs that changed the world. And if you look at all the list of the, just a sample list that I've put up there, all of these were started by single one or two men, mostly one, mostly men, unfortunately. And they are now all Dow 30 companies, Thomas Edison, General Electric, Henry Ford, Port Border, Cyrus McCormick, Caterpillar. It goes out, John Rockefeller, Standard Oil, who, which is now Exxon. If you look at the 20th century, these are legends in their own time. You've got people like Steve Jobs, who two of them started their, the world's richest company now or maybe the second richest, depends on what the stock for Amazon is, in their garage. Actually, in one of uh, the garage of uh, uh, an angel investor, 
uh, well, I think, no, I'm sorry. This was Steve Jobs who started it in his garage. And as you can see, all of these have turned into giant companies, but were started with one or two people with a great idea and with some investment. And now if we look at 21st century revolutions, these are also entrepreneurs that are changing the world. Google has changed the world. Amazon has changed the world. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Tesla, SpaceX. And these are all people that started off one or two people with some angel investment and they turned into giant corporations. And just as a tickler, as a teaser, my future revolutions that I'm looking at that one should be investing in, maybe artificial photosynthesis, desalination of oceans for drinking water as water starts to run out in the world, 3D printing, electrical clothes where you generate electricity from your clothes as you move, the next great battery, cure for cancer, the use of CRISPR for gene editing, the autonomous vehicle. But my favorite, which I think would be the hardest to do, is to create Michelin quality TV dinners. But entrepreneurs innovate, fundamental as Newton's three laws. They're the ones that create jobs, create wealth. 95% of all jobs are created by companies five years or less in age. But for all of these ideas are not enough, you need money. And where do entrepreneurs go for money? They start with the three Fs, then look at maxing out their credit cards, not taking a salary, perhaps getting a loan or two. But when that runs out, it's the angel that has to step in because the VCs, the venture capitalists are not yet ready to venture. To paraphrase a famous book, angels dare where VCs no longer venture because VCs have become increasingly risk averse and angels are filling that gap between when an idea and a founder with the three F money starts to where serious professional money can come in to give them that uh, acceleration out of the valley of death. Angels are now investing in earlier stage ventures with a higher appetite for risk. But along with that, there is an underlying element of altruism, a strong desire to give back. Most angels tend to be somewhat older, have had their own run of success, hopefully, have made their shares of mistakes and are in a position to give back. This is basically um, an approximation. I don't have exact numbers on the three Fs and entrepreneur in uh, monies, but in 2017, it's about equally divided up between the three groups of investments. The angels put in about 60 billion and the VCs put in about 60 billion in the year 2017. And if you look at what the VCs did, we don't have the detailed analysis of angels because there is no association that tracks it. But in 2017, there was about 4,400 investments totaling about $59 billion, averaging $13 million a deal. And if you look at where they all went and where they came from, three states accounted for 80% of the total venture investment in the United States. California, of course, being the runaway number one. Now, if you look at the extreme right column, I put in dollars per capita of the state because that also says that even though the dollars may have been small, like in Massachusetts case, they're equal to California based on the number of people in that state. However, California dominates the world of venture capital. And if you look at my own state, Texas, it's pretty far down at the bottom. And the reason I bring this up is because of the gap that exists between the idea and the venture capital investment. And that is what is being filled by angels, particularly here in Texas. You may not need as much of it in California or Massachusetts because you have that much professional money. They meet some of these needs and I have boiled down, this is again, my own theory. I boiled down the uh, types of angel investors into four types. First of all, there's the accidental angel. You're not in the angel investing business. You don't have a whole bunch of money set aside in a foundation to invest. And you're having dinner and you run into somebody and they've got a great idea and you say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. And so you get, you know, maybe you've had three glasses of wine and you're in a very pliable mood and you get involved in accidentally investing and you don't do too many more of those. The second category is the emotional angel. This kind of angel is the one that has a connection to a cause. 
A good example could be, let's say someone's child has diabetes and they'll run into a founder with an idea to cure diabetes or to have some medicines for diabetes. And there is an emotional tug to invest in that venture. So that I call the emotional angel. And it can be various types. For instance, you might go ahead and invest in a movie because you want to be involved with Hollywood stars. That's also my definition of an emotional angel. Then there's the group angel like C-Band. Uh, these are people, as Hubert so very, very well explained, who will write checks of five to $25,000, group it together, get somewhere between two hundred and $500,000 as total as an organization and invest it in a startup. And then there's the super angel. The Goose Group is a great example of that, uh, where the check size is considerably lar larger because there's a larger group, maybe 25 people. I mean, a smaller group, but writing much larger checks. The average goose check is anywhere from two to $5 million in a startup, which is handy for a startup that needs a lot of money. So these are the four kinds of angels. Back to those five initial questions I had when we teed off and the opportunities. So the angel has to look at what is the idea? What is the product? Does it have a market? And looking at the quality of the founder, the inventor, and the management team. Where is the company in its development? Is this very, very early stage, just an idea, or is there some IP involved, or is there actually a prototype, or is there even a product? What are the stages of risk? Is there technology risk? There's too much left in terms of development, or is there IP risk, or is there financial risk, or is there market risk where this might be over are populated with competition. And also there's time and they have to look at when to invest. What are the exit opportunities? How far before then do you come in? Do you come in at, again, once again, at the very early stage or some, sometime a little bit later? And the best way for me to walk you through all of that is to use the example of Goose because I'm very familiar with it and it's very easy to explain for me. Goose Capital, what does Goose stand for? Very humble, very self-deprecating, very laid back acronym. Actually, it's not. It stands for Grand Order of Successful Entrepreneurs. And not something I would have chosen. I would have rather call it horse, staying with the animal uh, metaphor. Humble order of really slow entrepreneurs. We're all old guys, so we're slow. So that's, see, once again, I'm not getting any feedback in terms of a chuckle because everyone's on mute. So back to my point when I started. Uh, Goose was founded in 2005 by two legends, Rod Canyon, who founded Compact Computer, and Jack Gill, Silicon Valley venture capitalist, and was initially created to fund the Rice Business Plan Competition Grand Prize. But now it's morphed into truly into a super angel group. It's currently 26 geese, but in grammatical terms, it's 25 ganders and one goose because we've only got one lady and 25 men, mostly old white guys. So I say mostly pale, male and stale. And I am the one that is only male and stale, just not pale. The Goose model is we go after very early stage ventures and focus primarily on the founder inventors. Are they smart? What we like to say scary smart. And are they coachable? There's no point having a scary smart inventor who thinks they already belong in the corner office of a giant corporation. Is the idea compelling? Is it innovative? Is the marketplace something that can handle a brand new entrant? We are industry agnostic and we take a very active role. And then I'll come back to why that's important because that I think is very important for most angels. You've got to perform the due diligence, take a seat on the board, sometimes as chairman, and bring the other geese along to co-invest uh, co with you, providing hands-on mentoring and advice as you move forward with this company. So far, we've invested $60 million in about 34 companies, 12 of them from the Rice Business Plan competition. Off that 60 million, 20 million was in initial rounds and about 40 million in follow-on rounds. So we support the companies that we invest in and that's also a very important characteristic for an angel investor you have to be prepared 
and you must have the wherewithal to write follow-on checks. We've had five exits so far out of the 34, we, in which we invested 10 million and we've exited with a multiple of 3.9. 25 companies are still alive and well and four sadly have died. We have a board seat or chairman in 20 of them and we are lead investor in almost all of them. And why is this lead investor so important in angel investing? It's because in any kind of financing, you need a lead investor, you need a lead angel. It's the first to commit saying I'm in, leads the due diligence efforts, negotiates the pricing, valuation, discounts, interest rates, whether it's a convertible note, whether it's an equity round, all the terms, negotiates the documents, deals with the lawyers and gets the deal closed with the founders. That's what the lead angel does while being supported by his co-investors. Typically takes a board seat and works on the investment after the deal is closed by mentoring the founders on an ongoing basis. I call them the vigilant bumper guardrails of a bowling alley that prevents the gutter ball being thrown by the founder. Believe me, I've thrown gutter balls when I was bring, uh, when I had my own companies because I did not have mentors. 40 years ago, mentor, mentoring really didn't exist but it does today and that's been uh, quite a change in, in the angel investing landscape. Does most of the work, angel lead angel on the investment syndicate and rarely are they co-leads, though that sometimes can happen. First to put the money in, not the person that put all the money in, but the first and the pipe piper for others to follow. It's the first step in that process. He's proof to the other investors that the deal is there, willing to risk his own money, has vetted it to some extent and is worthy of writing a check. Size of the commitment matters of that lead angel because following the lead angel will be all of the others. Let's say the total raise is half a million. The lead angel needs to contribute at least 100,000 of it, a meaningful amount, north of 20%. Otherwise, you're not going to get that Pied Piper effect. It sends a negative signal. And the rest will ask, why did the first investor commit so little? Typically, the lead angel knows the company well, though that's not always the case. But mostly, the co-investors tend to be strangers. A great example of how a lead angel uh, created a tsunami was the 2014 Rice Business Plan winner, Atesis Medical. They're a company out of Germany. They are to this day, and by the way, those of you who don't know, right, the Rice Business Plan competition is the world's richest business plan competition with prizes in excess of $2 million every year to 42 university startups. You have to be a university startup to compete. And to date, only one international company has won the competition. That was in 2014, a company from Germany, from the University of Aachen and they won. And Goose, as I had mentioned in one of my earlier slides was created to give away the grand prize and the grand prize in 2014 was 200,000. Today, it's about twice that. And none of the geese were really very thrilled. They said, well, you know, what are we gonna do? We don't know German tax laws. We don't know German regulations. We don't know whether those 59 patents they claim to have are real or not. Uh, maybe we won't invest. And we were huddling at the gala when the prize is given away. And I stood up and said, well, folks, I speak German. I understand this company. I'm willing to write the whole check of 200,000 if none of you are. So let's go ahead and give that first prize. Guess what? The amount we eventually ended up investing in adhesis was three and a half million. And we exited at eight times. We got an 8x exit on adhesives just two years after our investment. So here's a great example of that pipe piper effect and how it can be the, the, you know, the, the, the start of the wave. Being a lead angel also brings additional responsibilities. You have to have the bandwidth to engage with the founders. You have to have the ability to be available to the founders when things don't go so well, when things slow down. 
promote the company, particularly when you're behind schedule on progress. Have some altruism in serving the company. It just shouldn't be about investing. It just shouldn't be about what's my exit. And re, as I said earlier, you have to have the wherewithal to re reinvest in a follow-on round. And no self-dealing. This is something that I find a, lead investors and in angel groups have more often than not been self-dealing, giving themselves lots of stock options or having side deals for the founders. And that is anathema. That should never happen. Complete transparency should be the key calling card and reporting that transparency consistently to the investors. And most importantly, mentor the entrepreneurs. When you not invest, what's the, what are the danger signals? Well, it's usually the late angels call and try to avoid the accidental and the emotional investing and focus on due diligence. First and foremost, vet the founder, founders, even check out their families. Give you another example from our goose rice history. In 2017, one team came in third, which was a German team again, just so happened. And to most of us, the technology was most compelling. They should have won the competition based on what they were, but they were Germans, they didn't have fluent accents and there is an inherent bias against international companies in any domestic competition. But anyway, Goose was so interested. And again, I, I was the lead angel on this and we had put together soft circled $6 million to invest in this company. It had been the largest check we'd ever, ever have written. So I flew out to Germany to do due diligence and the initial couple of days was terrific. Their technology was everything they claimed it to be. Their patents were solid. But the more I hung around the founder, the more I got uncomfortable. He, it was not even him so much, but it was his family that had lived during the last days of world had been born, you know, when World War II, Germany was losing and their cities were being bombed. And they had this real, um, angst vis-a-vis -vis Americans. And it played out sometimes in the negotiation. And so finally, I'm, I made the call that this was too toxic an environment for us to risk $6 million and we backed out. So that's when you make the call not to invest is, number one is I think the founder, the management team. Number two is make sure it's not a clever idea, just looking for a problem. The world is littered with clever failures. And finally, mentoring is just like trying to, you know, chain the wheels on a car while you're driving down the highway or constructing a parachute after you've jumped out of a plane. Because starting and running a startup is quite difficult, particularly for a first time entrepreneur. You have to act decisively and correctly. And Oftentimes the outcome is dependent on the founder or the manager or the CEO's skill and knowledge. And if you're short on any of these attributes, it's not uncommon. If you haven't made the mistakes before, mentoring can be the big difference. I've always said the best way to learn is not from your own mistakes, is but from other people's mistakes. Learning from your own mistakes is the second best way to learn. But learning from other people's mistakes who are willing to tell you their mistakes and guard you, be the bumper guardrails, as I said, that could be, that could make the difference between survival and success. And it's more than just advice. It's commitment. It's personal guidance. Because you can get a mountain of generic advice from the three Fs, from websites, from Google, and it's nothing like what a good mentor will provide. A good mentor is experienced, candid, even when the message is not so beautiful, has the expertise to fill in the gaps that the entrepreneur lacks and is committed, stays involved, ensures continuity in the guidance and works with the entrepreneur, even willing to make a sales call or fly to another country to negotiate a deal. That is what a good mentor slash lead angel must do. So 
Thank you all very much for listening. And I'm looking forward to getting all your questions. And I will stop, stop sharing screen. Thank you, Ashok. Um, I've, I've got one question here that, that, that uh, I will attempt to answer, if it's okay. Uh, the question here is, what is the best way for us to start as angels in terms of deal sourcing? And uh, let, me, let me attempt answering that, and then you can jump in as well, Ashok. But, uh, you know, the easiest way really is to, is to be a part of a... Uh, organization or a network that does it. CBAN, Chicago Booth Angel Network, is one such network. You know, many of the other big business schools have their uh, have similar networks, but these are organizations where you know entrepreneurs know to go and and present their plans and seek angel investing opportunities. Um, like the other networks, we also have a rather extensive uh, evaluation process and criteria. Um, and so we, we ourselves will go through this process of evaluating and presenting them. Um, if you live in Houston, uh, there is another organization called the Houston Angel Network you may want to consider joining. They, uh, they do, however, have a, a $1,500 or $2,000 annual membership fee. If you live in Central Texas, there is a uh, Central Texas Angel Network also, if I'm not mistaken, and Dallas may also have a similar one. Um, if you are calling in from some other part of the country, we have C-band chapters that I mentioned in, in New York, Chicago, uh, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, and other parts of the world as well. Anything you want to add to that, Ashok? No, I think that's, uh, that's very good advice. I think um, uh, if you're not willing to um, be kind of like a lead angel, I think joining a uh, sophisticated angel group like C-band or Houston Angel Network or there, there, are, there are dozens, hundreds of them actually, is, is, is uh, the best way to go because the due diligence work can be done by experts. Yep. And that is oftentimes the key to making uh, the decision whether you invest or not. The next question is, what third party costs should you expect as an angel investor? How should you approach finding the right legal tax, et cetera, advisors? What's a reasonable cost for these advisors? Well, if you're part of an angel network, they already have access to lawyers and accountants who can, who can help. And they also have boilerplate documents that can be used without spending too much um, lawyer partner money on developing a convertible note or developing a safe agreement or any one of the instruments you may use to, use, to invest. Uh, I would say... If it's a one-off, unusual one, like we had for the German company that we invested in in 2014, our total uh, investment for legal and, and, and other documentation fees ran about 1% of our investment, so $35,000. But typically, it is a lot less uh, because you don't have to deal with issues as German law and 59 patents that have been filed in the US, I mean, in Germany, and how do you get access on, on a you know, global basis in perpetuity to those kinds of, uh, that kind of IP. So the 35,000 was a little high. I would say normally you should be able to do all of it between five and $10,000. Now the question is, how do you manage your time as an angel investor with a rising number of investments? Do you have assigned angels to certain investments? In Goose, we do, yes. And in all the other angel networks, I do believe, like Houston Angel Network, CBAN, you can jump in, Hubert, how you do it. But uh, that's why I think the lead angel is, is the key. The, the, the lead angel has to commit the time. Uh, Pre-COVID days, the commitment that we all had to make is that if you're on the board, you would attend four board meetings. Now, not always did you attend them. Not always were you able to get on a plane and fly to Pittsburgh or Chicago or Boston or or... Frankfurt, Germany, uh, but you have to make that commitment. And then since at least those of us in Goose are old guys, male and stale, we, uh, we have the time and we would make the time. Uh, in, I, 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 in I'll, add, I'll add that, you know, typically, you know, 
people don't, angel investors don't get board seats. You've got to be something like a goose investor to really command or demand a, a board seat. Otherwise, yes. it's not easy for angels because, you know, the typical angels investing five or 10 or 20,000. Uh, I'll give you an example. We recently, uh, I led a round um, with um, uh, 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 an investment actually that won the Rice Business Plan uh, competition earlier this year. Uh, and even though we ended up only investing 100,000, it, it really wasn't a lot of uh, equity given the valuation of this company and the traction it has already built, right? So that's not the norm. Uh, you'd have to have tremendous credentials like someone at Goose uh, or a significant investment to really command or demand uh, a, a board seat. Yeah, but Hubert, let's say Sivan or Han, Han, which does 300 to $500,000 in the total because they've got 30, 40 members writing $5,000 checks or $20,000 checks. You could, depending on the company, you could potentially sure. get a board seat. Yeah. And then what you do is from the 30 or 40 people who have invested, you typically request the person with the most expertise in that industry to be on the board. Yeah. But you're right. Most, most of the smaller angel investments don't qualify for a board seat. But if you are a significant angel investor, you, will, you should demand one because you need to look after the investment of your fellow uh, angels. Yeah. And, and, and a typical good entrepreneur will send out a quarterly update and you know, once or twice a year actually would also uh, facilitate a live presentation or session to the angel investors. Yeah, and, and we make that a requirement in the documentation we signed before investing that we do get quarterly updates. It's a requirement. Legally, it's, I mean, they sign off on it and we can then harass them if they don't. <laughs> okay, there's, there's a question here that goes back to your 6 million goose investment, Ashok. Well, so when when you are investing the six million, how do you how much equity do you normally ask for? Well, typically at Goose, we invest in um, a, in the form of a convertible note. One of the reasons angel investors like convertible notes is you don't get into this war with the founder on valuation, and a convertible note is usually a debt instrument that converts upon a venture capitalist or some other qualified financing investment where you get a discount to that valuation. So let's say on the German company where we put in three and a half million, we had the right to convert at a 25% discount to a VC series A because we called ours a seed round even though three and a half million is typically more than a seed round. <laughs> or a cap of $12 million. Now the cap was the toughest part to negotiate because that sort of sets a floor valuation, but it's, it was generous enough for both parties. And we ended up converting at, at the cap at 12 million. That's why we got 30% of the company. Um, can you please elaborate on what is a clever idea? <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> that you invent the next great telex machine. <laughs> that would be a clever idea, but the market doesn't exist. Now, a really good clever idea, I think one of the great ideas currently is the autonomous vehicle. That will change the world. That will change all the industries. So that is a truly clever idea versus a clever idea that may fail is the next great telex machine. I think most of our audience doesn't even know what tell is. Yeah, but you know, I'll add something to, to what you had said earlier. You know, actually, the biggest decision factor really is is the team. Yes. Um, you want a smart team. Uh, I don't know if this friend of mine's online, but just before the session, I was talking to a friend of mine in Silicon Valley, who said he had invested in a an oil and gas uh, AI company last year. Of course, you know, AI, uh, oil and gas is a bit of a crapper right now. So he suggested, hey, take this to some other industry. And they went to an investment bank. The investment bank liked them so much. The investment banks, you know, says, forget, let's, we're just going to buy you out. And in under a year, they're getting a 5x return. Wow. He invested in a smart management team that figured this out very quickly. So yeah. uh, there are lots of clever ideas, you know. People come, yeah. used to come to me and say, oh, hot, hot mail, what the hell? I had that same idea. And I said, why the hell didn't you do that? Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do angel investors avoid getting crammed down in subsequent rounds? 
You don't. I mean, you can't avoid it. Um, when when companies need money, they have to raise it. And if you are a serious friend of the company, you will do whatever it's unless you want to write the check yourself. Uh, you will do what it takes to accommodate fresh money coming in. So cramming down is actually you. It would be very difficult for the company to raise future funding if you had non-dilution protection in your documentation with the company for the money you invest at such an early stage. And the poor founder may be so strapped at the time you are ready to write 200000 or $500,000 check that they may accept it, but that is not something one should do. Look, if the company needs money and is not able to have enough, you know, sort of sex appeal to cause people to want to write checks and it has to drop its valuation, you as an angel will get crammed out. That is a fact of life. And you have to be prepared for it, just as founders need to be pre uh, prepared for it. And uh, some of the companies I deal with, the founders say, gee, you know, when this is all done, I'll only have 20% of the company. I'll say, and I said to them, let me quote to you what my professor at the London School of Economics told me once. He says, gentlemen, remember, 50% of something is a lot better than 100% of bugger all. <laughs> so... As a founder, you have to be prepared for that uh, dilution and also uh, as an angel, because you run right shotgun with the founder. You're not a counterparty, you're not an opponent. You have to be in the same boat, so you will also get diluted. Uh, next question, do you recommend creating a business entity to make your angel investments or just invest personally and skip the paperwork? It depends, the answer is it depends. It depends on um, what your tax situation is, but you know, if you're just writing five, ten, twenty thousand dollar checks, uh, skip the paperwork. Okay. If you're going to write million dollar checks, maybe then you're going to create paperwork. But typically, uh, the, the entrepreneur will have the paperwork ready, right? No, no, I think the question was you as an angel, do you want to create a holding company? A, a holding company, yeah something like that through which you funnel your investments, uh, limited liability corporation. Well, yeah. Okay. If you're afraid of liability, yeah. Make an LLC or an LP out of it and then invest with that vehicle, but, uh, skip the paperwork. Yeah. Mostly. I mean, I will add that if you're investing through a group like CBAN, like yeah. we would most probably put together a, a group, we would do it as uh, through an LLC. Yes. And you'd be a member of that LLC. Correct. Um, what is the typical length of an entrepreneur's angel investor pitch deck? Also, do you think short investor pitch videos are helpful for startups to differentiate themselves and attract lead angel investor interest? That's actually a very good question. Uh, I would say that a typical pitch deck should not last more than 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, it should have all the components. It should have the product, the idea, the technology, the IP. You don't have to spend too much time agonizing over your financials because the one thing is certain about any pitch deck financials, it's wrong. <laughs> I, I don't know anyone who can see three years out at a, with a startup and know what, what's going to happen. So focus more in terms of the competition, the, 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 your secret sauce. Why are you different from anyone else? And keep it to 25 slides, a minute a slide, uh, 25 minutes. Insofar as, uh, what was the other part of the question? Uh, videos. Videos. I would, look, I, I would not do a video in uh, pitch. You, it's hard for you to email somebody a video pitch deck. I would do enough so that they then ask for a Zoom meeting or a meeting in person once COVID is over. But I would not, but I would, and again, I'll go back to that German company of 2014, Adhesis Medical. What absolutely blew everybody away was a 30 second video of them using their surgical adhesive. It was a surgical adhesive that you used inside the body to seal wounds. And there was this video, of someone slicing open the lung of a pig, the blood gushing out, them applying the video, uh, the adhesive and it coming to a complete uh, seal. And that blew everybody away. That, that, that was, so if you've got something that compelling, yes, put that in. 
But if you've got something prosaic and you know just a me too kind of thing, don't bother. It just makes people irritated. Okay. Are we encouraged to invite industry contacts of ours to invest with this group? Would they have to pay a membership fee before they invest? Uh, you're absolutely encouraged, and no, they would not have to pay a fee. Okay. I mean, the the you know the SEC uh, actually changed the rules. Uh, and the definition for who would qualify as a high net worth individual investor. And they expanded from beyond people to uh, businesses as well. So, uh, you know, if you go to our website, there is a link that actually provide, it will take you to the SEC language that will tell you, um, you know, who qualifies or what kind of entities qualify to participate in such opportunities. Okay. Okay. What are the various red flags that you are looking for when, an, when angel investing? Well, I think I covered most of them in the deck. And I mean, uh, Hubert, if somebody wants the deck, we, we, we feel free to share it with them. No problem. Um, I think that, you know, it goes back to the founder, the founder's coachability, smarts, of course, and the product, the market, the competition, and the secret sauce. Why, what long-term sustainable competitive advantage is your idea or your IP or your technology have? I mean, it, it may not be IP, it may be know-how that you don't wanna put out in a patent and let the whole rest of the world know what you're doing. But those five components are key, but it goes back to founder and team. That has to be the first hurdle to cross. And that's why even though everything else lined up on that team from 2017 from Germany, we pulled out at the last minute. Okay, next question, uh, which I, I will answer. Will there be opportunities for co-investors to meet slash vet the founders? Can co-investors mentor the founders? Absolutely, and that's, that's encouraged, right? Uh, if a co-investor is interested in being part of the due diligence process, by all means, let the, co the lead investor know. Uh, I, I, I cannot think of any lead investor who would not welcome the, the assistance uh, and another pair of ears and eyes to help with this process. Uh, and mentoring, you know, quite frankly, I mean, that's a big part of what we use to, to convince the, uh, the entrepreneur to actually go with a certain group and say, hey, look at, you know, how cool our members are and look at the network and the contacts we, bear, uh, we bring to bear. And uh, that's part of the selling process. They make it the smart money rather than just green money. Uh, to confirm, can you pool your money with others to meet accredited investor criteria in order to invest? And the answer is no. You have to ind individually self-certify that you meet that criteria. Again, if you go to that link I provide on our website to the SEC documentation, it will tell you uh, who, uh, uh, can, who would qualify to invest under that. Um, next question. You talked about the process of angel investment, investing, example, sourcing, negotiating term sheets, due diligence, et cetera. If we are here for educational purposes, will there be subsequent events that train us to read these those documents? That's for you, Hubert. Uh, absolutely. In fact, you know what I would what I would welcome is if you again go to our website. Uh, there is a uh, email that you can send us and say, hey, you know, it'd be good to have these kinds of events in the future because we are committed to doing uh, uh, these on a pretty regular basis. So. Uh, and I think, you know, amongst our network, we know enough of people uh, who can come back and make, make other presentations. If you like Ashok, I know I've always liked Ashok's presentation. I know he does some fantastic presentations on many other topics related to business and entrepreneurship. Be happy to. Thanks, Ashok. Uh, are there valuation consultants that specialize in valuing startup equity and convertible debt? Yes. They exist, but I wouldn't bother. I mean, it's like, I always like to say, what does a consultant do? Well, he charges you for borrowing your watch to tell you the time. That's what a consultant <laughs> does. That's what yeah. these experts do. They will, you know, they, they, they borrow your watch, tell you the time and charge you for it. Yeah. So but, uh, I, think, I think if you have a good group that you belong to, you will have plenty of expertise within that angel group of people who have negotiated deals, who have a sense for what valuation is. I think once you get to the point where you start to go public and you have to start pricing options in a much more rigorous fashion than you can when you are very early in your stage where your options 
can be priced at very low numbers. That's when you need to bring in an outside valuation expert that will put an imprimatur on the valuation that you are pricing your options at, which then become a great motivator for employees. But till then, and that would be you as a founder, as a company investor, I think your valuation argument has got to be on the skill of your negotiating more than anything else. I mean, I've walked away from deals because I thought the, uh, the founders' demands were outrageous. And you just, you know, very politely say, well, that's, that's, that's just not, you know, that's not right for me. And very often, you know, it's, it's not inappropriate to ask an, an entrepreneur to, to say, hey, where do you come up with that number? Correct. And of course, you know, they'll always pull some comps out. Well, so-and-so was bought by so-and-so for $400 million, but that so-and-so had revenues of, you know, <laughs> 50 million bucks and were on a ramp and had a product that had FDA approval or whatever. And, and here you are, you know, saying, I want to be like them, but I want to be valued like them. So we get all kinds. We have quite a few. So I'll answer the next one. How can someone young best become involved in angel networks aside from just joining? Uh, you know, quite frankly, we would welcome uh, enthusiastic young people to be part of our evaluation process, our due diligence process. So uh, send me an email, you know, uh, again, through our website and uh, I'll keep you in the loop when we have our future sessions. Uh, if you if you know entrepreneurs who'd be interested in applying, that's another way to get your name out there with the entrepreneurs and say, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a good conduit and I have a good reliability with these networks. So if you're interested, just mention my name and send the, uh, your application. That's a good way to get involved as well. Okay, what's, at what stage of a venture should an entrepreneur start approaching angels? Well, when you run out of money from the three apps, um, you've raised your initial round either through, um, through uh, you know, maxing out your credit cards or your savings account and some family money. And long before you run out of that money, you should be either approaching angels or getting involved in pitches to angels so that you don't have to then have desperation where you've completely run out of money and then you know, your arguments are much more difficult to make on valuation. Okay. What is the time frame of angel investment in an entity? In and out in four or five years or something else? Well, I would say that uh, it's anywhere from two to seven years. I would, I would give it. Two is very good. Seven is slightly on the long end of average. And sometimes they can go out even longer, 10 years. So two to 10, let's put it that way. And you have to have patience. And then again, you know, look at that. Valley of death is nine out of 10 deaths. So, no, so you will have to say goodbye to some of your investments and you have to be prepared for that. Not every angel investment will have an exit of whatever, two to 10 X. Yeah. I remember a, a, a very well-known venture capitalist told me he said, you know, we we'll typically invest a fund in, in, 20, in 20 companies. 10 of them will, will disappear, those investments. Five will return pretty much what we invest. Four uh, will give back about 3x. But then we hope for that one that's going to give us that 100x that justifies the whole fund. And if we don't have that 100x, we're not going to be very successful with the fund. Correct. And those are, those are experienced VCs. Numbers. Yeah, but that's more the VCs. I think an angel is typically happy with anywhere from two to 10 X. Yeah. Because most angel investments get taken out long before that hundred X valuation comes either by private equity or by acquisition M and A. If a VC does come in, you that, then, you know, I mean, you're a unicorn, then of course it's different. Okay. What can a corporate investi investing uh, person learn from angel investing? Follow the same template, follow the same kinds of due diligence, vet the founders the same way, look at the IP the same way. I mean, I, I think investing is investing, whether an angel or a VC, the VCs just tend to come in at a later stage. The angels come in at an earlier stage. In your corporate investing, it depends on what your charter is. I mean, if you're like Shell Ventures, they invest in fairly early stage oil and gas ventures, uh, like an angel would. Uh, but if you're with 
I don't know, uh, like uh, JP Morgan has a strategic investment vehicle. They wait till it's almost institutional kind of one. But, but the process is the same. Make sure you have a good team, make sure it's a good market, make sure it's good IP, good secret sauce. It's not overly populated with competitors that are gonna eat your lunch. And the management team, management team, management team. As we start angel investing, what should be someone's typical starting check? 5,000, 10,000, and I'll answer that. Yeah. It, you know, it depends on what your pain threshold is, right? My, my guidance to investors in my, for example, I'm actually going through for one of my startups, um, an angel investment round. And what I tell uh, uh, investors is you put in money, you're not going to lose sleep over. Because most of the time, as Ashok said, nine out of 10 of these investments are going to fail. And, you know, you're not going to put in your life savings and then you know, you're going to lose sleep over it and say, here's a rule of thumb. Your total invest angel investment portfolio should be no more than 10% of your net worth. So if you have a net worth of $200,000, well, maybe 20 K is a good number. If you have a net worth of $2 million, 200 K. If you have a net worth of a hundred million dollars, maybe 10 million is your appetite. So I would say that, that's a good rule of thumb, but you know, it all depends. Yeah. What are some of your biggest lessons slash mistakes from when you first started angel investing? Uh, to be an emotional investor, I think to get carried away with the individual or the particular process, that would be the biggest mistake. Not to do, not to be intellectually ruthless, intellectually while caring passionately. You care about the founder, you care about the customers, you care about everything else, but you gotta be intellectually ruthless while conducting your due diligence. I've gotten better at it. In my early days, I was not so good at it. Okay. Uh, do you recommend that we start out angel investing uh, via sites such as Equity B, which offer ESOPs in startups for public? Um, I don't. I don't know what, I mean, I basically all my angel investing is done either through Goose or me individually on my own. Uh, that, that I don't know what these other, what about you, you Hubert? Maybe you're better equipped to answer that question. I, 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 I am not familiar with these, to tell you the truth. I, I uh, you know, uh, I, I personally, I prefer to, to get to know the company, the founders, uh, angel investing, in my opinion, is a very personal thing. Correct. Um, if you're doing it through some third party entity and you're not getting involved in it, uh, I think your money would be better served putting it into some stock that you uh, or some uh, yeah. ETF or a fund that you're better researched. Uh, at the end of the day, guys, I'm guessing a big chunk of the people here are booth graduates. So uh, you know better than I do <laughs> about making sound investments in that area. <laughs> Okay, we're almost done. I know we kind of run over our time. You can hang in there, Ashok, a little more. Oh, absolutely. I okay. reserve the evening for you, Hubert. Thank you. Uh, with those angel convertible notes, are caps typical? Oh, he said, never mind. He answered it. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, it's, they're not. No, that, that's actually a good question, Hubert. They're not typical in most of the angel deals I've seen. I insist on every one of them. And it's as a result of that, it's become uh, de rigueur in all of the goose deals. But our first capped goose deal was 2014's Adhesis German company. Till then we'd never put caps in. But so, so I think the cap is something that is a must, but it is not implemented. I, I've seen more deals without a cap than with a cap. Well, of late they're becoming pretty, pretty much the norm in convertible notes, I'm sure. Yeah, okay, right? good. Yeah, okay. What's your opinion on raising funding through crowdfunding? I, I can answer that. Please, um, I cannot. You know, uh, that sometimes tends to be a pretty uh, interesting channel. Uh, it's not cheap. You know, they, they will take some equity uh, and significant percentage, but finding a, a good one uh, can be quite beneficial because uh, they will have significant networks that they can tap into and bring a lot of people to bear who, you know, it's like, like politicians raising funding. You know, you've got $100, $500 and all of a sudden, you know, you've got a couple of hundred thousand dollars you need uh, in an angel round uh, that's been collected. 
but also you'd have to do a fair amount of marketing and pushing on your own uh, to, to get people to be interested in going through the crowdfunding platform. So it's kind of a, a crapshoot over there in my experience too, right? Unless you have something that's compelling, uh, something. Now, somebody asked the question about the video. In my experience, putting together a video on a product and how it's working and operating can actually uh, go a long way in a crowdfunding yeah. uh, platform. Oh, that's uh, you have to have a video for yeah. crowdfunding. Okay. Um, I'm just I'm almost done. Uh, calling, uh, a lot of these are just administrative points here. Um, I, uh, what books would you recommend are worth taking notes on? Uh, uh, guilty as charged, I don't read business books. I find them patronizing. I find them self-serving. The, you know, uh, how I made a, a million dollars. Well, he made a million dollars by selling you books. Uh, I tend to more gravitate towards people who have had the experience. That's why the mentor is so important. Mentors, plural. And also soul search all the time about your own mistakes and what you could have done to avoid them. And I keep a written list of my 10 worst mistakes. And the tragedy about that list is it changes because I've made a mistake that has bumped number 10 off the list. Got it. Okay, I think we are out of questions at this point. Uh, Ashok, I'd like to thank you. Um, this has been... Uh, uh, been fantastic at least for our, you know especially considering this is our launch event i think we had a lot of good attendance but fantastic questions really appreciate it and thanks everyone for joining uh please do register to to attend our event next week i promise you those companies we're presenting are very interesting and exciting ones uh and i think you'll you'll find uh, it's a good learning at least even if you decide not to invest you'll find it a good learning experience to see how one of these sessions goes Okay. okay. Thanks, everyone. Again, anybody who wants the who wants the deck, please, Hubert, feel free to send. Yes, it. yes, we, we are we are making arrangements for, and also the recording. I hope will be going. Okay. On. Great. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you all so much.